welcome everyone to Arizona Bioscience Week and the AZ Advances Innovation Showcase. Today, we are going to be hearing from some amazing leaders. Um, following that, we will have our fast pitch competition where all of you will have an opportunity to vote for your favorites and the winning companies will get prizes. And then beyond that, um, we're going to have a panel with our rock star um, investment leaders. If 10 years ago, I joined AC Bio. And the very first um, member call that I ever had was while I was sitting in a hotel in Tucson, getting ready for some meetings. And I had the opportunity to speak to Derek Metzold, who was running an emerging growth biotech company um, and partnering with um, our community here, as well as in working in Texas. And we spent some time and he gave me his perspective. And now 10 years later, he's going to give his per share his journey and his perspective with you. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Derek Metzold of Castle Biosciences. So thank you uh, for the introduction and um, and all I can say is what an honor it is here to be able to kind of share the Castle story, um, <clears throat> which started in large part uh, in Phoenix and is still there. In fact, I talked to our our uh, the lady who heads up our human resources department. I think we're just cresting over 100 employees, which are almost all based in kind of midtown Phoenix there. Um, so a, a fantastic uh, place to go from one person in 2008 to over 100 people uh, today and, and more in the future. So it's an honor to be here. And, and what I put together is a, is a short presentation that kind of walks through the castle story, uh, trying to emphasize maybe some learnings that we took along the way. Um, and some, some falters and some falls that we took as well. So hopefully the individuals who might get value out of this can kind of think about from their own perspective, uh, are there any kernels of knowledge here that will help help make us all more successful? So with that, I'll kind of get started here. Let's make sure IT is working properly. Let's see. Oops, there we go. Okay. So um, one slide on me, because this is about Castle, not about Derek Matzold. Um, just as, as some short background here, I spent about 24, 25 years uh, in the early part of my life uh, working solely in, in pharmaceuticals or biotechnology companies, really working in four different uh, companies overall, uh, two large pharmaceutical companies and two small biotech companies, all of which, interestingly enough, uh, have been swallowed up by mergers or acquisitions. So I'm not sure what that means for us necessarily, but it's just an interesting fact. And in 2008, I um, had the opportunity to, uh, to take a check in life and decided to, um, to, to start uh, a company from the ground up. And that is what has now become Castle Biosciences. What Castle Biosciences is, is a molecular diagnostics company, not a pharmaceutical company. Uh, when we, we also started the company, there were just three of us, um, no money in the bank but a business plan and we kind of took it from there and uh with that from a background experience of sort of sitting at the helm with some very important leaders at the company we were able to grow castle from a foundation of, of essentially an idea in 2008 when we operationalized the company to what it is today which is a, a company which is largely serving patients who are diagnosed with skin cancers to enable them to understand the biology of their specific tumor better and be put on the most accurate uh, treatment pathway to hopefully improve their outcomes as far as, as far as far as possible. We do have one remaining legacy test for UV melanoma that we'll talk about in just a few minutes, but that's essentially my background. Now we can focus on what's more interesting, I think. So more interesting here is a video that we compiled um, earlier this summer for our, um, our in-person uh, national sales meeting to kind of let people who we're new to the company uh, in the sort of uh, COVID, COVID or post-COVID time period. Get a sense of where we started, where we wanted to go. And with that, let me see if I can click on this properly and kind of walk through the video here real quick here. We 
decided to start Castle Biosciences, it was recognizing that there was a, a huge gap between how patients are being treated if you rely solely upon sort of the clinical and pathologic features available by traditional staging of diseases, in this case cancer, and you ignore the potential impact on the biology of a tumor, biology of cancer, which we use by measuring the, the genomic profile of that cancer type. It's interesting, those of us who I think have chosen healthcare as a vocation, you can go into healthcare many different ways. You can become a clinician serving patients one by one basis, or you can go and work for the industrial side of healthcare, maybe working for a pharmaceutical company or a, in Castle's case, a diagnostic testing company where you can impact many patients because your test is available to more than just one patient in front of one doctor. We went into, into healthcare at Castle because that it's a passion for us. It's always been about how do you impact patient care the best possible manner. And if you do that right, and you do it right more of the time than less of the time, then the rest of your business follows along behind that. We try to harness the genomic information of the biology of that tumor, that cancer, and provide that on top of what you already have so that a more specific and more precise treatment plan can be developed for an individualized patient that's better or more accurate in terms of addressing outcomes than if you don't use the biology of that tumor. If we focus on what is the current treatment paradigm, where are the limitations, what decisions are being made based upon pathology features, and can we improve those decisions? And improving in the case of our melanoma test might mean actually reducing unnecessary procedures and it might be finding people who have high risk disease despite having low risk pathology and getting them appropriate care. Um, that's the way that we've approached our business, beginning with UV melanoma, moving over to cutaneous melanoma, and more recently with our, with our recent launch pipeline test. And in the case of our Decision DX melanoma test, in the case of our Decision DX SCC test, in the case of our Decision DX DIF DX melanoma test, we're able to apply higher level machine learning techniques and get to answers that weren't visible to the naked eye looking at raw data. That's the exciting part of innovation to the R&D team and to me personally, is to be able to say, we've taken something which looks like nothing and created a test that now makes a difference in patient care. And if we keep that approach as we continue our pipeline development in other disease states, then I think we'll be highly successful in finding not only a, a test that works, but a test that actually adds great value to patient care. What makes Castle different overall? Uh, is, there a, is, there, is there a uniqueness to Castle Biosciences that we should talk about? I, I think we can, we can tackle that in probably three or four items. Uh, first and foremost is keeping patients at the center of our business. If we aren't improving patient care, then we should get out of town. Secondly is the employee group that we've attracted to Castle and kept at Castle. We try and find people that not only enjoy working hard, working hard in terms of, of solving issues facing patients, but also like to work together. They want to contribute working with their colleagues to push harder and better so we can meet our overall core mission. Those are exciting opportunities at Council, and we do that through people, we do that through innovativeness, we do that by going back to the beginning and saying, is the way patients are treated with a certain condition today optimal? Or do we think harnessing the biology of that disease or that cancer in some cases or other disease disorders in others can be improved if you apply genomic information innovatively to get to a better answer. Um, that's exciting at Castle. We've been very blessed by, by finding people who I think value the work product that they do over the income that they get. But I'd much rather people who are interested in coming to Castle who really want to get in the same boat, swim hard downstream, and be able to, at the end of the day, step back on shore and say, man, we can turn around the last five, six, last 12 years, last 20 years, and look at the impact we had on patients that we served. If we can do that, then I think we've done a fantastic job in not only meeting our business objectives, but maintaining our, our, our focus and our vision and finding some really, really positive people that we can call home and call family. Hope that was um, good use of the, of the time there. That that video, um, as I said earlier, we produced for really sort of um, 
what I thought was a post COVID coming out party for the company um, to really let people who weren't here at the beginning, but part of our expansion of over 350 employees now across the US appreciate, I guess, where we, where we came from, what we think is important to us and those themes, uh, putting patients first, making sure that every decision we do puts patients at the forefront of our, of our goals will lead to um, business success. If you combine that with a teamwork of culture, innovation and hard work. And I think those examples there as the slide shows here is today we stand here as a leading uh, dermatologic diagnostics company. Um, we do try and find people, as I indicated in that video, who, who fit the mission, um, who really want to work in healthcare to drive uh, improvements in patient outcomes going forward, who are good team players and who enjoy working. If we find those individuals, then they, they're they such a solid fit at Castle. It's, it's just fantastic to, to, to be a part of this growth opportunity. So I mentioned we, we focus predominantly today really in the dermatological space. Uh, right now we have uh, three skin cancer tests that are available, as you saw in, in the video there, uh, one for people diagnosed with cutaneous melanoma, one for people diagnosed with squamous cell carcinoma of the skin, and one for people who have had a mole removed, um, but the there's uncertainty around pathology. Is it melanoma or is it not melanoma? And those are the three offerings we have in skin cancer today. We have a robust pipeline uh, also focused largely in our dermatological call point that's being initiated as we speak. The most exciting one, I think, or the largest opportunity is really looking at getting out of skin cancer, by the way, but focusing on people who were diagnosed with inflammatory skin diseases. So what is that? Uh, atopic dermatitis or psoriasis when they're considering moving from topical agents to systemic therapy, which is largely speaking biologics today. And our goal there is to um, see if we can develop a test in the next couple of years that will end up, uh, rather than having a patient try two, three, or four different biological therapies before they find the one that their particular unique psoriasis or atopic dermatitis reacts to the best, you know, best efficacy is let's try and find that the first time around and save patients from nine, 12 months of trying a trial and error to get to a therapy that will actually treat the disease best. So with that, that essentially is Castle. And as we've executed well, uh, that also puts us into a very, very strong financial position, um, which is an area where we can now, again, continue to invest our capital to drive uh, innovations, to drive market share, to drive market penetration, to improve uh, the outcome of patients diagnosed with these conditions. From a um, from sort of a of a what matters most or vision standpoint, I think um, by and large, every um, product opportunity that we think about, every commercial program that we that we spend and invest capital into. Our pipeline programs are the first and foremost of the objective is, is what we're going to do being able to improve patient care or not. If the answer is no, we move on and don't do that. Uh, that's how we selected our initial products to focus on in our internal development. That's how we focused on our initial products in terms of what to license in before we actually had an internal R&D engine. And if we keep those principles in place, we believe that actually uh, works best for patients, works best for the business. The other area that we focus on is really putting people first in the company. And what I mean by that is that um, all of us, I think, have been in organizations, maybe even led organizations, where you have sometimes gotten way ahead of your skis and you've sort of expanded too fast or hired too fast and uh, things don't work out 100 percent. And you've got to make choices that are tough sometimes in terms of employee reductions in staff. Uh, at Castle, we started Castle, uh, Kristen uh, Oschlager, who's our chief operating officer and oversees, among other things, the, the Arizona facility, and Toby Juvenal, who's my chief commercial officer, and I, one of the things we, we thought through was, do we need to overextend? Uh, how do you want to treat the people who want to call Castle home? And I think one of our core philosophies was to start by saying, we, um, we won't open a position for employment unless we're highly confident that we're going to have a need for that job in three years. And that need's not based upon 100% goal attainment. It's based upon a reasonable business plan. Um, and so far, we've been blessed enough to go ahead and achieve that. And so as a result of that, we interview employees. We, we first, of course, want to make an assessment of will they fit good for us. And the last part of it is to say, if we choose to make an offer to you, 
Um, we want you to think about that um, over the weekend. Take your time because if you're coming to us, we expect you to be here for a long time. That's our plan. And as a result of that, I think we have um, out of the 300 and maybe 40 employees or so we have so far, I think in 12 years of existence or so, maybe we've had 25 employees leave the company. Uh, that's a really, really low turnover rate, high, high retention rate. And I think part of that is because we, we, we act true to our word here in terms of how we treat people. Um, the other area is that when it comes to sort of setting us up for success early on in the company, I think one of the areas that we focused on, we talked about this a bit uh, prior to the opening of the presentation with, with Joan and the group was um, we've, we, we still make conscious decisions. Um, do you have to go ahead and spend that money to, to, to drive the vision of the company forward? And early on, that meant largely working from home. If we didn't need an office, why pay for an office? That meant largely um, looking for things that we could do more efficiently than just saying, well, other companies do it this way, so therefore we must take some of our capital invested over here. Instead, we made some, some choices that we'll talk about in, in a few minutes, which I think extended our runway quite a bit when we were a very, very small undercapitalized company and even the middle of our life in the middle of last decade before going public. And we continue to, I think, take that approach with our finances in that if we see an area that we could invest in, is it actually an area that we should invest in? And just because we have it in the bank, that doesn't necessarily mean that we should go forward and, 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 and make an investment choice in that area. So where does this take us to now? Um, I, I think this is an interesting slide here. Uh, so when we first uh, mapped out our business plan, uh, not on a paper napkin, on a couple of pieces of paper, um, the idea behind the company was to say, you know, in 2007, 2008, we had seen the, the sort of emergence of the Human Genome Project. And we saw the emergence of some diagnostic tests, mainly in breast cancer, come to the marketplace. And even in 2007, 2008, we were seeing um, treatment plan decisions, therapeutic decisions being made in women diagnosed with, with breast cancer that before those tests were available, it was basically um, everybody gets, gets on the same train, you get the exact same treatment pattern. And based upon understanding the biology of, of, of an individual female patient's breast cancer, physicians were able to go ahead and make personalized choices. And we thought that was quite interesting. Um, we thought that was an opportunity to really build a business plan around. But the question is, what do you focus on? How do you get there? And our concern was that um, having not raised capital before, having not started a company before, what makes us think we could do what? Develop a test in breast cancer that was better than the four or five that are already out there. I think our answer was, I don't think what would make me think that except ego, and that's not a good thing to invest in. And so we, 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 we took a step back and said, well, what else do we know about ourselves and this area of mucker diagnostics? And the, the uh, three of us, uh, Chris and Toby, myself, as well as our early investors in Castle, all had kind of a common theme background. Either we were we had family members or we knew of individuals who were afflicted with rare diseases or rare cancers. And if you happen to be somebody who's diagnosed with a rare cancer, or rare disease, certainly you care as a patient, your family cares, your physician treating you cares, but industrially, a company uh, who say was, was developing or validating tests in breast cancer to reach 300,000 people can't afford to develop a test to reach 2,000 people. It just doesn't work out that way because your business is scaled differently. Our early business plan was to say, hey, we think we can focus on a company which is scaled to go ahead and be successful or at least not flame out if we focus on rare cancers and build it around that expectation that we're gonna have six, seven, eight tests that help people with incidences of two, three, four, five, ten thousand 10,000 patients per year, not 300,000 patients. If we do that, and watch our risks, we should be able to do what? Help improve the lives of those patients diagnosed with those conditions where nobody else can industrially care. And if we achieve that, we would expect physicians to go ahead and order our test because it's gonna make a difference in their treatment choices. And we expect to get reimbursed and have a viable business. And so that was the early days starting out was to really thinking about where can we start a company in this area of molecular diagnostics, harness the knowledge of the Human Genome Project, and where can we be successful? Where can we add value to the marketplace? And the value wasn't being the sixth or seventh or eighth breast cancer test. The value was an innovation and helping people who, who needed help to have better treatment choices. So that's how we started out at Castle. Now, how do we get there? Um, 
I guess this is a very nice slide. It kind of connotates some underlying themes throughout the last 12 years at Castle. First of all is trust what we know from a strength standpoint and also trust what we don't know and don't assume that we know all things. So as I mentioned earlier, we, um, we had no molecular diagnostic experience. Uh, I had some business development and, and, and commercialization experience prior to starting Castle. Uh, Toby Juvenile had a long track record of leading and managing sales teams at several companies. Uh, Christian Oschlager had a, a solid track record, a long track record in terms of clinical research, uh, you know, moving clinical protocols through the Arizona pulmonary group that she worked with there, uh, and as well as hospital systems. So we, we kind of knew what we knew, but we also said, well, none of us have really ran a laboratory. So how do we address that? One of the areas was, I don't think we need to be a laboratory that owns a laboratory to start with. Why don't we find somebody we can partner with? And that's actually what got us to Arizona. I'll talk about that in a few minutes here. So we, we were very careful in terms of saying, what are the areas that we have good confidence around our competencies? But equally important is what are those areas where we don't have good confidence that we know what we're doing? And if we don't, let's find a partner that can figure that out. And one of those areas was actually the laboratory. Another area was billing processes of procedures like diagnostic tests as opposed to therapeutics like drugs and, and, and uh, biologics. We also figured that we weren't gonna be able to raise a whole lot of capital as a new company. So we better make sure that we figure out when, we're, when we are failing, fail pretty quickly and move on, as opposed to dig our, 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 our head in the sand and not look up and say, man, that was a huge mistake that almost toppled us. So we tried to de-risk our growth, de-risk our march forward as successfully as possible. And that meant also being humble enough to really realize when what we're doing is actually not working very well, fail quickly, learn from that and move on to the next level. We um, were also, um, it was interesting if you turn the clock back, Joan, we talked 2011, but Castle was really a 2008 opportunity, you know, right during that last, I guess, major recession or, or depression time period, which we had no idea was coming, of course, by the way, um, and saying, okay, we've got a small base of capital here. Uh, how do we allocate that? How do we make sure we minimize our fixed costs? How do we make sure that our variable costs are what drives the business? And so that was an important element was to say, it'd be nice to have a nice office to, to work out but do I need to spend the capital there or do I go ahead and find a molecular technologist to work in my laboratory and spend the money over there? So we made certain trade-off choices that in hindsight extended our, our, um, our, our, our investment capital as far as possible. We were getting early, early traction on revenue tests. Then the other one is the last one here, which is really um, not necessarily focusing on disease states that we liked personally or had a bias towards but rather focusing on disease states where we could see and map out a strong unmet clinical need that we believed could be helped if you had a more precise diagnostic test. You could approach it from a personalized medicine standpoint as opposed to a one size fits all population based approach. And so with those elements, that led us to our first in license test in the melanoma space, which was a test that we have branded Decision DX UM. So what is this condition? This is a, a, a condition of UV melanoma, which is essentially melanoma of the eye, basically a freckle in the back of your eye. Uh, about 2,000 patients are diagnosed with this condition every year. And as a test, we don't do what? We don't cure patients. We don't, we don't provide a therapeutic benefit. We help classify patients differently. And what that means in UV melanoma is that before our test came along, the best sort of risk stratification factor was a retinologist or a, a ocular oncologist looking through a patient's eye or doing some ultrasound scans and saying, this looks bigger than smaller. Maybe it has some other adverse features in it or doesn't have those present. And that might move your expectation of prognosis from 50-50 to 60-40 or 40-60, meaning 50% of the time that patient will go on to metastasize and be at risk of death from an eye tumor. And 50% of the time, a patient won't be. Well, it's either a yes or no, not 50-50. And so the inventor of this technology in St. Louis or Washington University in St. Louis was Dr. Bill Harbour. And he developed a genomic profile test, 15 genes measured by PCR techniques, very classical, very easy. But the outcome of those genes by themselves were, were, were nonsense. He had to go in and develop and using artificial technology, artificial intelligence techniques, to go ahead and find an algorithm that would actually make sense of these genes that were over underexpressed in people who ended up not metastasizing 
compared to those who did metastasize. And the result of that is an assay, which, which today is used in about 85, 90% of all patients across the US year in, year out. It's a, it, 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 it's a test where if you happen to have a low risk capsule class one score is how we call our test result. You have about a two or three, three or four 4% chance of metastasizing. 95, 96, 97% chance of not metastasizing. If you have a high risk capsule class score result, a class two result, that risk goes to about 85%. Those are two very different patients that should be treated very differently. And that's what our test offers people is really a chance to sit down with their doctor and say, okay, we've treated your eye tumor. Now let's talk about what we do after this. Are we gonna be concerned about metastasis or not? And with that, I'll share with you a short video here from one of our patients, Kevin, uh, just about his journey impact of a test like this has on patient care. And if we can develop tests like this in other areas, then we've achieved our goal and our mission as a company. I'm Kevin. I live in Philadelphia and I'm a cancer survivor. I was diagnosed in 2019 with ocular melanoma and went through the diagnostic procedures and the molecular testing for the tumor and then went through surgery and radiation therapy. And I'm now in observation uh, two years later to ensure that the tumor doesn't spread to other organs in the body. Actually, when I was a teenager and a young adult, some of my optometrists spotted uh, the little spot on my iris on the front of the eye. And so starting in 2012, I started to undergo annual observation. So then in May of 2019, I remember the visit. We discussed what his findings were, that there were some of these brown cells that seemed to be migrating from that original spot on the iris and heading towards the white part of the eye. And so that was a signal that perhaps this tumor was starting to spread, even in the smallest bit. So I went home at that point, and in the month of June, about a month after the initial clinical diagnosis, I was attending the American Society of Clinical Oncology meeting in Chicago for my work. And while I was there, I met two ocular melanoma patients at the patient advocacy booths. And before I could get much out, uh, they redirected me to Castle Biosciences, who was exhibiting in the hall there. And as soon as I walked over there, I was astounded at the availability of this type of genomic prognostic test. So later in June, I went back to the hospital and had the biopsies performed, and the one extra aspirate was taken and sent to Castle in Phoenix. When the report was generated, I realized that my score or my result from the Castle testing was a class 1A, and that is the most favorable prognostic score. And when it was read by a world expert, he said to me, Kevin, this is not the picture of metastases that we would expect to see. And he said, your chance for metastases is extremely low in the next three to five years. And with that, I have to tell you, these findings were of huge importance to myself and my family and put myself at rest that we could move on. The Castle Uvial Melanoma Prognostic Platform can truly be life-changing. So again, an example of, I think, the power of what um, more precise, more, more precision medicine can offer patients. Uh, in the case of Kevin here, having a Castle Class 1A test result um, meant that yes, he's going for follow-up care for his UV melanoma as he should, but on a much reduced surveillance program. And uh, he and his clinician are focusing really on maintaining eye health or vision. And that's a fantastic outcome for patient care. Now, um, one of the comments I talked about earlier prior to this video was how do we kind of manage risk, I guess? How do we de-risk the business in terms of not failing early on? And one of those choices was to look at, at the fact that we did not have clinical laboratory experience. And through a variety of connections from Texas through to West Texas, over to Phoenix, Arizona, and through TGen, we got introduced to St. Joe's Hospital, which is now Dignity Health, I think is, is the branded name there here in Phoenix, um, and worked with a individual who ran the Molecular Diagnostic Laboratory at St. Joe's Hospital Medical Center there in, in the Midtown Phoenix, and came in agreement saying, hey, we have um, a number of tests that we're evaluating about licensing in, completing some clinical research work, making them available clinically. We don't have knowledge of how a laboratory works like this. We know what we want to do. We have our SOPs, but we're interested in, in partnering with a group that's already in existence, already has quality and trained and certified technologists 
that we could have perhaps contract with you on a piecework basis. So if we get uh, orders in for our UV melanoma test, like with Kevin, you'll process those in a timely fashion. But if we don't, we, we have a very, very low fixed cost base. And so we entered into a very nice relationship with St. Joseph's Hospital in 2008. And they served our research and our, and our clinical needs for, for quite some time. Now, what's interesting is that even back then, as we pull up our old business plans, we, we, we assumed, and this was in a very open dialogue with the medical director of the, of the laboratory director there at St. Joe's, that we got to around $12 million in revenue, which has a certain assumption for test volume underneath that. We would probably outgrow their capacity. And that was about the right time that we would consider building our laboratory. And so 2015, 16 came along and the choice was made to say, hey, we're, we're seeing some, some, some constraints of St. Joseph's ability to really uh, meet our needs. And we're seeing a substantial increase in projections of test volume. We need to go ahead and figure out how to, how to control that destiny better. And so that was a time we decided to take capital and invest in our own clinical laboratory, you know, a couple of streets down and up from, from St. Joseph's Hospital there on, on Central and um, Avenue there in, 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 in Thomas and Phoenix. And, and that was a good thing. Uh, at that point in time, we obviously had spent, I guess, nearly eight years working with St. Joseph's Hospital. And so we kind of had profiles of, of technologists that worked out well in the laboratory. We had already built out our own clinical services group, so we knew how to manage that process. And we ended up building out a, a, a laboratory space, uh, as I mentioned earlier, on, on 7th and, and Indian School, where we're there today and, and building and scaling going forward. And that's also where I think the next sort of castle culture began to emerge, which we'll talk about it in just a minute here. So that was essentially one way of, of dealing with risk reduction. How do we go ahead and not overspend, not get ahead of our skis financially when we don't have to? And let's put investments in where we can actually manage those things. Hopefully more is variable cost than not. So what about the next point of that? Well, in early 2010, when we first launched the UV melanoma test in the U.S., we were seeing uh, commercialization uptake that we thought was tracking our way. And as I mentioned earlier today, uh, we were testing around 85, 90% of all patients diagnosed in the U.S. Back then, of course, we, we tested the first one in December 2009. But we were seeing traction, acceptance, and adoption because of the utility of our test and helping adjust patient care. A year or two later, we looked at it and said, well, are we going to take the employee base at Castle? and have it solely be linked to our success in licensing in other people's technologies? Or is the time to start thinking about building out our own internal R&D approach? And so we hired our first PhD, I think in 2010 or 2011, and we began thinking about what are some other areas we could, we could work in uh, successfully. And the first area that we looked at was to say, the sort of risk stratification that we do in, in uveal or ocular melanoma is there a need for that in cutaneous or skin-based melanoma? And our assessment of literature was absolutely there is. It's an interesting um, and, un and disappointing fact that um, most people with cutaneous or skin melanoma are thankfully diagnosed early. And as a population, it's a fairly low risk chance of actually going on to metastasize or spread. That's fantastic, by the way. And there's a few people who are diagnosed late, later with regional disease like, like a melanoma cell or some lymph node. Um, Unfortunately, though, because there's so many people diagnosed with, with what looks to be lower risk earlier stage melanomas, it happens to be that the majority of people that are at risk of progressing and dying from melanoma are those in the low risk category. So we figured we could go ahead and take tumor biology and harness our approach there. Now, the approach that we took there and we've taken since then is to say, we don't necessarily need to find genes that we like we need to find genes that make a difference to the tumor. And so we started out with a very biased approach of saying, hey, we want to assume that the tumor knows best and we know little, and let's take an approach from that standpoint discovery-wise. We also made active choices back then. It's about saying, what's the analyte? What are we gonna measure? What gives us the most information about how that tumor might be behaving in the human body? And one of the elements was to say, well, DNA is quite attractive, but it's more than just mutations that drive behavior of tumors. It's epigenetic factors, it's, it's, it's post-translational, pre-translational factors. And just because you do or don't have a mutation in a certain gene, doesn't always translate to that having an effect on the patient, on the tumor's progression or outcomes. Uh, proteins are very far down, difficult to go ahead and manage as well. And so we selected RNA as the, as the analyte of choice, which also happens to be where the majority of, 
of, of, of, of tests like ours that predict outcomes in tumors are developed on. We also looked at analytics. How do we want to approach this? A very simple methodology, a very simple nomogram, or do we go ahead and, and contract with or hire and eventually a small bioinformatics team that, that is skilled at, at really harnessing artificial intelligence, deep learning techniques, what we call them today. Back in 2010, we called them machine learning techniques. It wasn't quite as sexy to say artificial intelligence as it is now. And we started that process. That's how we go ahead and, and develop a castle from, from a base of nothing to something. Now, along the way, we chose to outsource our analytics to SAS. We chose to outsource them to some contracted statistics here in Houston, um, uh, but, but eventually brought that in-house. Why? Because data ebbs and flows and early on in protocols is not a whole data analyzed. So why go ahead and pay for a salary basis if you can lower your fixed costs and contract that is needed? So that was the approach that we took early on in developing our own tests in-house, is what do we have to do internally? What's the expertise you want to gain? And what expertise can we contract with until we get to a size where we can now go ahead and afford that? We also looked at size in the organization back then. So for the first several years, when we had three employees and four and five and six, all of us had sales territories. I did, uh, the head of the, of, the, of the operations group in Phoenix did, Toby did obviously. And then we, we moved into position in 2014 or 2013, where we hired our first kind of sort of real salespeople to help us launch this cutaneous melanoma test. And in doing so, we tried to make sure that across the small organization, and even now across the much larger organization, that we embedded what we viewed as, as non-negotiable cultural foundations. As I said in the first video, we're far more interested in finding individuals who want to come to Castle because they have a passion of improving the outcomes of the patients that we serve. We expect income to come behind that, but I don't need people to come here and work for income. I want people to come to Castle because they, they want to live and feel the ability to turn back in one, three, five, or 10 years and say, I really had an impact on the patients that we serve. Um, and that's our approach here was to kind of move along here on a continuous fashion from a castle standpoint. For those of you who are considering, you know, do I stay private? Uh, is my company acquired or do I control my destiny and actually just scale a company? And if it's, if it's the right time and the right outcome is to go and consider going public. And we did that. I guess we probably decided that about 2015 or 16 looked at the, at the private equity marketplace and said, you know what, we're gonna be, be squeezed here pretty soon in terms of capital needs over time. Um, I don't think we ever believe that you can set a company up to be sold at fair value. If you put a for sale sign up, that usually is a bad for sale sign, by the way, wrong neighborhood, wrong time. Um, and so we figured we need to go ahead and prep ourselves for going public. And that included um, adding independent board members on top of myself and our, and our VC board members that included attending uh, investor conferences and pushing our ways in to kind of be in private tracks of investment conferences, just to kind of not even call it test the water, just, just, just get our name out there and people thinking about us as a potential IPO candidate. With the exception of our CFO, uh, Frank Stokes, we brought in uh, ahead of the IPO, none of us had had experience as a management team ever taking a company public. My approach to that is to say, then you better figure out what to do right and you better figure out what the de risk so you don't do too many things wrong and so we we engage as much as we could with analysts with bankers with investors at these conferences trying to make sure that you know um how are we seeing how we observed how's our business plan layout how do we change the story of our business plan to make sense of somebody who only has five minutes versus an hour and a half to think about the business of castle and apply those going forward and at the end of the day we assembled here post ipo very very strong team as we're public now with a, with, a, with a financial strength bench that includes um, a very strong uh, corporate communication, public relations group, and a finance group for SEC reporting purposes so that we stay compliant to our regulators while at the same time staying true to our, to our shareholders. What else do we have to look at here? Um, we did not have any sort of a process management function at Castle. And part of that, because we were small for so long, and part of that was because we were mainly a two product company until uh, the middle of last year, we launched our two most recent pipeline tests. So in the last year or two, we have scaled to include more of a, a process or program management system in the company to help us scale and grow, can keep us as a small function unit, but also manage our processes so that we don't go ahead and take our eye off the ball accidentally. And that build out, I think we put in last, mainly because we could. I think if there's other more highly regulated areas of, 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 of pharmaceutical products or, techno or biotechnology, early program management is probably a very, very strong investment choice to make. But in our clinical laboratory experience, 
we had process management running clinical tests, but the rest of the, of the, of the organization can actually work outside of a structured system. That's going in place now so that we, again, can handle multiple product opportunities, both in terms of what's in the marketplace and in an R&D, and make sure we're actually tracking against our goals. So in summary here, um, we, we do per, per put patients' lives first. And I think those of us in the AZ Bio community, those of us working in healthcare that are not part of AZ Bio yet, um, I think that's an important aspect. There are, there are many things one can choose to go into and work on. Uh, you can choose to, uh, my family used to be in, in the car business in the, in the Midwest. That's a fantastic uh, profession, not for me. I had a calling to really think about, about how can I spend my life improving the care of people without being a clinician. And this is the way I, I've done it, is to work, work through the industrial side of the industry. So I think, I think keeping people, keeping a passion for really wanting to improve patients' lives is a, is a huge difference. And if you can find that in people who are applying for a position as opposed to just a position, then that's, that's a fantastic game. We also took great pains at making sure we didn't scale too fast. And I think that's helped us culturally tremendously over time of being able to look back and say, hey, we went from three employees in 2008 to 340 or so in 2012, so uh, 2021 so far. And um, to know that every time we extend an offer or open up a, 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 a job posting, this is not about crossing our fingers and hoping our business plan works out. And in six months, if it doesn't, they're expendable. This is about saying, hey, if somebody's gonna be a good fit for Castle, from our standpoint and from their standpoint, we have an obligation to actually make sure that we have a nurturing environment that they, they can be focused on doing the best they can as they've been worried about our business plan being off by 10 or 20%. That's an irrelevant comment, or that's an irrelevant position to have us put our employees into. Uh, there has to be a high level of trust and value that. If things blow up, uncle, but if you have normal risk of business ebb and flow, that shouldn't impact an individual patient's employment potential at Castle. They are very important for us, and we live that, live, live that truism. And the second thing is, as I mentioned earlier in the, in the conversation here, is I, I still think we set Castle up for success. What does that mean for us? Early on, it meant really keeping fixed costs as low as possible until we figured out what our revenue might look like. Early on, it meant outsourcing as much as we could do uh, to meet that goal so that we could find experts that we could afford when we needed them or necessarily on our payroll when we didn't need them and then scaling at the right time. And I think today I look at this and say, you know, we're sort of planning now for, you know, what happens next three or four years at Castle? Well, we um, just launched two tests last fall. We acquired a, a, another test in May of this year. We, um, we opened up a pipeline program late last year, and we think with those things coming together, we'll end up here maybe six, seven, eight tests in the marketplace focused on dermatology in the 2025 time period. That's our way of de-risking growth, is to say we, we will no longer kind of stand on, on one or two gems only. We're going to find six or seven other gems to move forward. So with that aspect of Castle, I think we try to de-risk our growth. We've tried to make sure that we manage growth properly from an employee standpoint. And we make sure that we have plenty of capital in the bank because we can now access capital marketplaces. So with that, I hope that sort of summary of the Castle story um, is useful. Uh, add some value here and there. Um, certainly, you're welcome to go and reach out to our group in Phoenix or to myself directly if there's any follow-up questions or answers. And with that, Joan, you can take the lead from here. Thank you, Derek. That was awesome. And we are so thankful that you were able to uh, be flexible and join us here on Zoom um, since I was the one that said, sorry, we can't do it in person. Um, but I look forward to having you meet the team next time that you're in Phoenix and we are all able to gather together.